All right, so our next segment will be a turnaround management panel. Uh, our moderator will be Professor Harlan Platt from Northeastern University. Um, Professor Platt went to Northwestern University for his BA, got an MA at Michigan, and continued on to do his PhD at Michigan. Um, he is the... He served on the board of companies uh, on, the New York, on the New York Stock Exchange, and um, what's up? Oh, sorry. <laughs> and uh, he's actually the faculty dean of the Turnaround Management Association, and actually wrote the uh, the certification exam for turnaround managers. So, without further ado, further ado, I will pass it off to. Thank Professor you, Michael. Uh, you can hear me. <laughs> Gee, I feel like Mick Jagger. That's great. Uh, but anyway, that's the only thing I have in similar, similarity to Mick. Uh, Michael was a student of mine in my uh, business turnarounds class and suggested that a discussion of hedge funds, a discussion of alternate investment, would need to consider the flip side. Not every investment works out. Not every dream of a chief investment strategist like my good friend Jim Swanson's comes true, and sometimes the economy uh, either has a bump in the road uh, or there's a little blip, and when it slows down, companies begin to get in trouble. And that's where these guys come in. Um, I'm gonna give credit to Michael and to Nico and the team for pulling together these speakers. I really had nothing to do with it. Uh, Michael Grice, on my right, uh, is a very interesting person. He graduated from Northeastern University in the College of Business, and now he is the managing director of a sizable turnaround practice that goes under the designation CDG. He is the G in CDG. Um, just like EMC, you know, there's E is Egan and M is Marino, and... C is the third Northeastern member who uh, unfortunately left the company after six months. Uh, but Michael has a very successful firm. If I were to give you one company name so that you'd know what he's done, there was a company called Linens and Things. You might recall Linens and Things got in trouble. They called in Michael. And I remember his discussion in class one year about how he tried to save it and things arose and he couldn't. Uh, on my left, I have Andrew Troop. Andrew is a peripatetic lawyer. Fair statement? If I understood what you said. Okay. <laughs> because he, when he talks to students who've been to my class and they say, what firm are you with? He says, well, it depends upon what year. But he and his team, uh, they have some notable names too. They represented uh, an organization called the United States Treasury in the bankruptcy of General Motors. So they uh, did a great job there, and GM has come out, and they're profitable now. Uh, my great exposure with Andrew is a bankruptcy of a firm called Lyondell Bissell. It was something like the largest privately owned. Well, I'll let Andrew talk about it. It was a very, very large chemical company. Andrew was the architect of the plan of reorganization. Stock came out and emerged once the plan was complete and the stock is now 2x or 3x that price. Uh, Andrew asked me to join the liquidating trust to deal with 62 companies that Lyondell was getting rid of and we have one of the big creditors from Aries Partners out of Los Angeles on the trust with us and he keeps saying, I can't believe it, we've gotten all our money back. Thank you, Andrew, thank you. So with that, uh, I've. Uh, let me welcome them both to the panel. Okay, I, I just have to say, in truth and advertising, when he says they got all their money back, what, what, what he means is that we funded this liquidating trust uh, with $80 million and with the expectation that there would be no recovery for creditors. We thought that the $80 million would be what it would take simply to wind up the 62 entities around the world that needed to be wound up uh, in light of their... Uh, both their location, the time just to do it, but most importantly, the kinds of liabilities that these entities brought with them out of the liquidation. 
Um, and uh, what uh, Harlan, Harlan really means is that um, uh, we've collected more than we've spent in this process. So there will be a dis there, there was a, dis a meaningful distribution, about a $50 million distribution um, at the end of the year. So we, we've done tremendously well. But in terms of the size of the creditor body that got this distribution, it was about $13 billion worth of debt. So the $50 million distribution was a small percentage distribution. Uh, but it was gravy for everybody because everyone had written it off. And so when you've got zero on your balance sheet and you get, for some of them, out of the $50 million, I think the largest slug was about $14 million to one entity, um, everyone said, we paid for ourselves this year uh, and more so. So they were very excited about that. So that, that's the truth in advertising. Okay. Thank you. And it was the third largest petrochemical company, privately owned petrochemical. But as, as we go along, if you have a question, if you want to interrupt, so we're a little different than everybody else you've heard. Everybody else is talking about making money. This panel is really about fixing problems and then making money. You have to do the, the fixing first. So let me, let me pose a question to uh, Michael uh, to start us off. Um, there you are in New York. You're sitting at your desk which you probably rarely do, but in my hypothetical, there you are, and the phone rings, and it's a company in trouble. Who is calling you, and what are they asking you to do? Well, that's a good, that, you hear me? That's a good question, and uh, let me first say, add to what Harlan has uh, said, is that what you've heard, and I, I was here at the very beginning today, so I listened to virtually every, every speaker so far, and People, for the most part, are talking about the macro uh, economy and looking at industries and companies on a broad scale. What we do is much deeper into the weeds. We're looking at the individual companies and the individual segments of an industry because the economy and every industry is shaped like a bell curve. There are good performers, mediocre performers, bad performers. And we spend our time, in essence, working with or around the underperformers. So uh, to get to specifically to Harlan's question is that call would come in, first of all, unfortunately, it would come in on Friday, Friday afternoon, okay? And there would be a series of questions that demonstrated that the person on the other side of the, uh, of the telephone, which could either be an attorney, it could be the chairman of a board of directors, it could be a handful of, of frustrated lenders who start screaming across the phone that there are problems, people don't understand us, they don't appreciate what we're trying to tell them, and we need somebody like yourself to be able to get in and, and, and bring some, some calming influence and some credibility to a process so that an effort can, a joint effort can be put together to try to turn around a company's fortunes and unfortunately we can't make payroll by next Friday. By the way, we need to fix this immediately. So that's how that would happen and it has happened very frequently. It happens across a, a large number of industries um, and a, a lot of, of uh, investor types, hedge funds get participate in that because we know that when they look for investment opportunities, they are naturally drawn to securities that are trading below par. Trading below par does not mean, as, as Harlan has said to anyone who's been in his class, does not mean it's a good investment. It may be trading below par because it's a bad investment. Right. But uh, that's how my Friday would go. Well, let me, let me quickly follow up. Have you ever gotten a phone call that said to you, in three months or in six months, we're going to have a problem? That's far more rare. Uh, it does happen. Uh, unfortunately, it happens to my other partner. It doesn't happen to me. <laughs> OK, thank you. Let me, let me turn to Andrew now. And Andrew's practice is he's at a very large firm called Pillsbury blank, 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 and blank. but. Uh, <laughs> But uh, Andrew's work is primarily confined to this restructuring, reorganization, bankruptcy space. And so it 
to some extent, uh, when he's driving his car home on a Friday after traveling all week, and he heard, hears as people heard this Friday that the job creation uh, numbers were far below what was anticipated and Wall Street was now shaken, you're probably in the only car on the highway where, you, where you're not feeling badly. You're saying there's some more work coming down the road because uh, you're counter-cyclical is all I'm trying to say. Now, my question for you... You, you could have just said that. I, it would have been simple. <laughs> my question for you is kind of paralleling the one I asked Michael. Um, at what point do you get the phone call to say, we need restructuring attorneys to assist us in this matter. Where does that come? Well, just like with Michael, it often comes too late because we're normally the call after his on Friday afternoon. <laughs> uh, and, and I say that seriously. There's something, uh, for most companies, it is far less scary to pick up the phone and to call a turnaround consultant who isn't a lawyer than to call a bankruptcy lawyer. And there's lots of reasons about th to that. Bankruptcy is sometimes seen as the bad word. Uh, it is uh, sometimes seen as admitting defeat uh, in the face of uh, a, a crisis. Uh, and sometimes we need to be, uh, we are brought in as sort of the second step uh, in the process. Um, but that's not always the case. It, it depends on what sparks the concern about reorganization. So let's take two very different examples. Um, uh, let's talk about Lyondell Bazell for just a second. So Lyondell Bazell was a petrochemical company in 2008. If you sort of remember the, the, the price of oil, went from sort of like $40 a barrel in the second quarter to something like $170 a barrel, give or take, in the third quarter. Um, and then very precipitously, in the midst of the fourth quarter, it dropped to back down to about 40 bucks a barrel. And what happened when that came down, that the price came down, Line Bazell went tremendously out of formula with its asset-based lender. And its asset-based lender yanked about $2 billion out of its bank account to cause it to be in formula again. And I don't care how big your company is, if somebody takes $2 billion out, it's going to get your attention. And it's going to force you to start to think about things. And things moved extremely quickly there, right? So this happened to line up as a sort of end of November, beginning of December. They brought in a crisis manager decided, almost pushed to a crisis manager in part by their secured lenders. Um, we got retained on December 19th and we filed that case on January 6th of the following year. It was extremely quick. There was a beauty contest to become debtors counsel. They narrowed it down to two firms. Um, they did interviews in the morning and they made their decision the next morning. I mean, it was extremely, extremely quick. There's another matter um, that I worked on, uh, that, I, that I've worked on, where the precipitating factor was actually a criminal investigation with regards to whether or not there were either False Claims Act or um, federal corruption practices, FCPA. You know, did somebody bribe somebody overseas? And what happened in that circumstance is that the company looked at the projected expense for going through the investigations that were likely to be required by the federal government and others in this process. And they mapped it out and they said, if we lose just like a point, basically in revenue, we'll be illiquid by the end of the year. So on that one, we actually had a fair amount of runway, but it was really a function of something grabbing management's attention to make them look at the possibility of a liquidity crisis much sooner than it was actually coming along. Thank you, Andrew. You know, there's a, uh, a joke in, the, in this space that we practice in um, that talks about a river in Egypt, and it says, denial 
is not a river in Egypt because what you run into, for the, the root of my question was, CEOs and boards tend to practice denial. Everybody in the industry is hurting. It's not just us. Uh, things are going to get better in the spring. Uh, that new contract that we put out, that new product that we're hoping for, they'll work. So we don't have a problem. And then ultimately, as Michael was saying, when you can't make payroll next week, you go... Yeah, the, the answer is not to reach out to your bank and say, you need to give me more money. And that's what most CEOs and CFOs will do is they've got themselves to the point where they can't operate out of the tight space they've allowed themselves to get into. And they look quickly outside to the lenders. You know, it's what a famous bank robber, Willie Sutton, once said when they asked him, why do you rob banks? He said, because that's where the money is. Well, that's what these borrowers do. They reach out to the lenders and say, I need you to put more money in here. And of course, as we've heard you know, earlier this morning, uh, whether it be a hedge fund individual or a, a, an investor or rather a, a loan officer, they all have careers, they all have processes that they have to uh, follow in terms of granting uh, loans or putting in new investment capital. And uh, it can't be solved that quickly and usually the individual or individuals like senior management who have allowed the company to get into this position then to pick up the phone and ask for more money, they don't have the credibility to be able to get there. So they need to bring in professionals to help that, that credit, the, rebuild the credibility. And to do it, and, and obviously I'm being a little bit facetious, but not 100% in saying that we can't make payroll next Wednesday, but it's very common to be in a situation where in a relatively short period of time, say three months, our classic 13-week rolling cash forecast that we do, for every company that we get involved with, to run out of cash sometime during that 13 weeks. And it's our job to try to make changes, recommend changes, and then force changes on a company in order to be able to extend the runway uh, as to how long that cash would last to give the company and its lenders and investors an opportunity to, to look at all the different alternatives for the permanent solution. Right, but I also think isn't, you know, not to be also too facetious about it, I'd say nine times out of ten, the lenders come around and they lend some more money, at, at least to keep the process going for some time, right? They do, but not without a lot of anxiety and threats and... Uh, points. And, and yes, uh, yes, points. They take a fee. Sometimes the fee... Not, not even sometimes, it's gotten to the point now where it is routine for a fee to equal 100% of the loan that's being provided. So if you provide a hundred, five million loan, the, what, the amount you owe back is 10 million. Isn't that what we see in the gangster movies? <laughs> but let's, uh, let's turn to hedge funds. And uh, they're all different, but as Michael said the other day, uh, they're all interested in making money real quickly. So my question for both of you is, uh, is it realistic for hedge funds to look at distressed companies as an opportunity? Uh, Andrew, what do you think? And, and do you get these phone calls? We do. Um, it, it's absolutely realistic for hedge funds to look at, co at these companies as an opportunity. The, the issue is to be able to distinguish a couple of things. One is, uh, is this a company that actually is going to survive? And how is it going to survive? And the second thing that they have to decide is where are they going to play in the capital structure? The, the goal for most, investor, most hedge fund investors is they want to control the reorganization. And the way to control the reorganization, in part, is to figure out what the fulcrum security is in the capital stack. And that is the place at which the company goes from being solvent to insolvent. Uh, and that, because at the end of the day, that's the level of investment in the company that will be, that theoretically should be the new equity owners of the company and have the greatest opportunity for uh, recovery. Now, a name like Carl Icahn, 
comes up and he frequently will go into a distressed situation and he will, I'm just trying to uh, be explicit to what you say, and he'll look at the capital structure and he'll say, this is where I want to make my investment. So he tries to buy something and maybe he'll pay 20, 30 cents on the dollar. Higher up the capital structure in bankruptcy means safety. So those securities might be 80, 90, 95 cents on the dollar. And when I always ask students, where are you going to invest? They always go, I'm going to take the high level investment. And I go, great. If things work out, this kind of goes back to your comment. A friend of mine once said to me, buying a bond on, at par is speculating. Paying $1,000 for a bond, that's speculation because now you're hoping this guy pays you back. In contrast, if you're Carl Icahn and you go in and you buy a bond at 20 cents, that's not speculating, that's investing because he and his team have investigated this firm and they feel it will be solvent, it will come back, and that bond will pay them back $1,000 someday. So going from 20 cents to a buck, that's a 5x return. The normal investor who's buying the bond at 1000 bucks, well, if he or she is real lucky, they're going to earn 4% on their money for the next 10 years, and then if they're really lucky, they'll get their $1,000 back. I hope you see the distinction between investing and speculating. So Icon goes in and he wants to buy the 20 cent security. But Andrew, do sometimes do these folks find that they invested too low on the hierarchy? Of course. And what they happens do. then? Um, well, they should get flushed out of the capital They're structure. They're gone, baby, right? Uh, when they, if, they, if they make the bet wrong and Icon does it, just like everybody else, he's a portfolio investor, right? He's won and he's lost. Um, and that's what all these shops are trying to do. But the opportunities are tremendous. They really are. Um, uh, and uh, just to give a, a, a concrete example about it, I'll go back to Lyondell. Uh, Lyondell senior debt was trading at about 25 to 30 cents on the dollar. This was the top stack in the capital structure uh, the day before the Chapter 11 filing because of some things that we did early in the case, which I won't bore you with, that paper went up to about 70, 75 cents in about five days after the filing. Wow. Um, when it came out, it got converted to equity, most of it, at $17.61 a share. And Lyondell closed a couple of weeks ago at $60 a share. So a triple. So in, in the Lyondell case, if you were a par investor, you've made a little bit of money now. If you bought in at the 20 or 30 cents at that piece, um, you've made a lot of money. Huge money. Let me, I just want to add, add one more thing that's, that, sure. particularly in this sure. particular cycle, where I don't think the economy is as strong as perhaps some of the uh, previous speakers feel, at least from our perspective, uh, investors in distressed companies make money not only through the rise in the value of the asset in which they've invested in, but also in their ability to crush lenders below them. And that's a very important observation to make if you want to be in the hedge fund business, because as we all know, and it's been said many times, if you want a friend on Wall Street, buy a dog. <laughs> Did you want to ask a question? It's a wonderful question, and let me quickly repeat it in case people couldn't hear. How can there be a senior security trading at 80 cents on the dollar, meaning the market does not anticipate full recovery, and yet the securities below it might be trading at 40 cents, non-zero, is your question. How, how, that doesn't make sense to the, to the questioner. Andrew? Well, the market, markets are not perfectly efficient. Okay, it's, it, I don't mean to be too simplistic about it, but they're not perfectly ex, you know, efficient. And different parties are prepared to take different kinds of bets. Yeah. And, and I've seen uh, 
cases where the 80 cents gets paid out in full, the 40 cents takes over the company. I've seen cases where the 80 and the 40 split the equity in the company coming out. Disproportionately. Disproportionately, but they, they split it. And it has a lot to do with the fact that at the end of the day, when you're valuing this company for reorganization purposes, coming out of Chapter 11, if that's the, the vehicle you're using, is that it is a guess. We have lots of experts. We have lots of you know, people who give testimony and judges have to make decisions about value. There's also, the uh, real quickly, there's also guess. time value of money. That is, in bankruptcy, oftentimes you may accrue interest, but you may not receive it. And it's at risk. Now, in an interest rate environment in the Bernanke era, the whole concept of time value of money escapes me. Okay. But in, in a historical context where interest rates are 5 or 7 or 8 or 9 percent, time value of money is pretty significant. Bankruptcies last two years on average. So at 80 valuation might simply mean, I think it's going to get paid 100 percent or every value will be given, but it might be two, three, four, five years from now that I get my funds. Michael? Yeah, I would add to that uh, the point about the markets aren't, aren't perfect because just because a, a security is trading at less than par doesn't mean it doesn't have value equal to or greater than par. And in that particular example you use, and I understand it's hypothetical, uh, there's play in that 40 cent security because people feel that an event could occur that could cause that 40 to go up to 50 before the 80 goes to 100. And then the, the player in that 40 cent security can quickly get out, make a significant return on their investment for a pretty, pretty short period of time. Uh, with in response to really only a small uh, change in the operation or in the uh, public's perception of that, that business. Let me give and you a great example of inefficiency and bankruptcy. There's a company you might know. It's called Texaco, right? Huge company, money good company. It's got uh, stockholders' equities of probably tens of billions of dollars. Uh, they had a legal problem involving an acquisition, and they had to file for bankruptcy. Their senior bonds traded, were trading at 100 cents on the dollar the day before the bankruptcy. On the day of the bankruptcy, the bonds fell to 40 cents and closed at 100. Why? Well, certain funds may not, by charter, own bankrupt securities. So at 9.30 in the morning, when the market opened, Texaco bonds had sellers, they had no buyers. They found a buyer at 40 who sold out the next day at 100. There, yeah, Texaco is probably not a good example of anything. <laughs> uh, and not the least of which is when, when they filed for bankruptcy and they had as required a th what they call, we call a 341 meeting. It's a meeting for all the creditors to attend. Texaco served caviar. <laughs> Not terribly good judgment for a company that was in bankruptcy, but they didn't really get it. And uh, fortunately, that worked out relatively quickly. I always tell my students that the 341 meeting is the first time you'll ever hear a, a, an executive tell the truth. It's in federal court. They are under oath. It's in federal court. And if they lie, it's perjury, and they're going to go down. Every time you go to a, an annual meeting, I city, guess that's why all my clients make me answer the questions of the 341. <laughs> so you're the one who would spend time, right? I don't have to take the oath. Ah, excellent. <laughs> Makes sense. We usually try to send somebody to that meeting who knows as little as possible. <laughs> same idea. He didn't mean uh, to. No, no, same <laughs> idea. I'm not offended at all. It's, well, I, I, just one other thing Please. on your 80, on your 80 cent uh, issue, particularly recently, sort of playing off a little bit what, what Harlan said, um, particularly in the senior secured tranche, you can have lots of, in, lots of lenders who themselves are suffering uh, pressures on liquidity for a variety of reasons. So, your ba so the bank may not want, may need to put liquidity on its balance sheet rather than reserve 
against this stock. And so they'll start to sell, right? You create the supply, it's going to drive the price down. So it may not correlate to the actual value of the underlying that's investment. Yeah, that's all. an excellent point. It, that's the value of getting on the telephone and talking to people, the networking aspect, because you can understand more about the behavioral aspects of the people who are unloading that security uh, to determine whether or not it's really you know, a 40 cent security or it's, it's better than that because you can have certain, uh, as, as Andrew said, certain institutions need liquidity. Other institutions may have soured on that particular industry. There may have been a change in a portfolio manager who wants to take the portfolio in a different direction. There can be a lot of different things that cause any one particular set of, of transactions. So you can't just assume, again, getting back to the perfection of the market, you need to sort of do your homework in distressed area there is no, alter, you know, there's no uh, exception. You have to seriously do your due diligence. I'd like to uh, bring the conversation back a wee bit to turnaround management, to fixing companies. And let me just introduce that with Michael's statement that he made just outside the door as we walked in. And he said, this strategy is kicking the can into somebody else's yard. Can you talk about that for a minute? Uh, well, sure, I can, and, and I think it relates a lot now to the fact that there is so much money in the economy, and even bad companies, or let's say mediocre companies, or companies that are on the, the back side of the bell curve, are able to refinance their debt today at a cheaper rate, which means they're reducing one of the costs to the enterprise, that is the, the interest cost, but the business itself may not be getting any better, and in essence, what you do is you borrow more money, cheaper, you you get the maturity to be farther out than the current maturity is, and you, in essence, kick the can down the road under the assumption that someone else will be running the company or be in this position by the time that financing comes due. And that, that is a very, what we consider to be a very short-sighted uh, approach to turnaround management. We understand it because it's human nature not to want to do these things, uh, I know our previous speaker, uh, Jim, was talking about how, how many times he's been on TV, and how, but yet how few friends he actually has. <laughs> well, I'm a turnaround manager. I've been on TV three times, but I have no friends. <laughs> well, let me, let me ask the legal side now to, to my question about fixing up companies. Is there anything... That's right, just us. Is there anything the lawyer can do to forestall a bankruptcy, or when a company brings you in, is that fait accompli? You're going to file, they're going to court. No, um, I've been doing this for 27 years, and you'll find my name on the bottom of five Chapter 11 petitions uh, over those 20 something years. 27, it is really 27 years. I can't believe I said that out loud. Um, the, uh, uh, the vast uh, majority of what we do is out of court, and the process that we go through is not terribly dissimilar inside or outside of a Chapter 11 case. We're trying to achieve the same things. And that is, first, can you reach a consensus about a range of value? Because you're never going to reach a consensus on a precise value. But can you, with your constituents, reach a consensus on a range of value? Secondly, can you reach a consensus about the prospects for this company, its projected cash flow? and its ability to service debt on a go-forward basis. And, and if you can reach that consensus outside of bankruptcy, you can, in most cases, achieve the restructuring without having to resort to court. What bankruptcy really allows you to do is to deal with the problem of the holdout. And the way it, it does that is, think about it this way. You've got a credit agreement outside of bankruptcy, it generally says that to modify principal, interest, or maturity, it could also be other things, but generally those three things, it requires the unanimous consent of all lenders. So if you've got one lender, you just got one person that you've got to reach a deal with. If you've got five lenders and you reach a deal with four of them, that last one has a tremendous amount of power whether they believe it or not, if you want to try to achieve this outside of a bankruptcy. What bankruptcy lets you do is to force a restructuring on the holdout 
by getting sufficient majorities of creditors to vote in favor of a plan of reorganization. And so it reduces the holdout risk. It's a great description. I don't know if you guys had the opportunity to read the Wall Street Journal. It was either Friday or this morning, I can't recall. <laughs> but they were talking about the European experience and how in Europe they are beginning, and by the way, I read that article 20 years ago as well, but they are now beginning today to think about transitions in the European bankruptcy codes towards the American system. Let me give you one example. I think they were talking Italy, and they were talking entrepreneurs. In Italy, if you're an entrepreneur and you file for bankruptcy, and I'm going to tell you as I remember it, not as it actually is, so I'm close to the truth, but I'm not there, um, you can never form another company, period. So it never takes place. Whereas in this country, and I'm going to turn to Andrew to, to really give you the, the correct answers, uh, you did earlier say bankruptcy is sometimes viewed as a bad word. And having filed for bankruptcy, people sometimes say you have a stigma. But in fact, a lot of wonderful companies have gone through bankruptcy and used it as a strategy to take a short-term problem and get rid of it and then get back to the long term. So uh, could you sort of, <laughs> in two sentences, summarize the beauty of the American code, bankruptcy code, for our audience? What is it about it? Three sentences? Um, sure. So I can try. That doesn't count as one of my sentences. <laughs> um, uh, what bankruptcy does in its, in its simplest sense, right, it is allows entrepreneurs to take on business risk, to shed it if it fails, and to get a fresh start or rehabilitation in its, in its simplest form, that's whether it's an individual bankruptcy where it's called fresh start or a corporate reorganization where it's called rehabilitation. Those are the fundamental goals of what the code is intended to do. And on its worst day, it's known as a full employment act for lawyers and it is extremely, extremely expensive. And that's why we have these processes that try to get things done out of court. In order you, to you avoid, get paid out of the estate too, right? I do. I do. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I, I I didn't say I said it that. Way. I I heard somebody say it that way. Uh, but I wanted to add just a, a a little wrinkle to what Andrew had said before about getting together and determining is there a consensus on what the value of the company is, and that consensus and it's it's almost always reached at some point in time in a restructuring process. But it's a range of value. It's not a number. It's not a finite number, it's a range. And senior lenders who are of the traditional type, like commercial banks, they like to see the valuation at the highest end of that level because they want to avoid taking a write down which would be a reserve against their capital. Hedge funds, on the other hand, for the most part, my experience, is they want that value to be pegged at the lower end of that range because they want to have a higher return on their new investment. And so what you have is you have competing views as to what the value is based upon what they need to achieve in their own organization. Let me ask one last question of both of my guests, and then we'll turn uh, to the audience for your questions, and I, I hope we have a couple. Uh, it used to be said that turnaround professionals were akin to emergency room doctors no relationship with the patient. They solve the immediate problem through a triage approach, and then they go on to the next patient. But in the short while that you've gotten to know Andrew and Michael, I hope you notice how calm they both are and how intelligent they both are. And so it's my view, and this is a question now, is it true that this field has gone beyond being an emergency room doctor to being a therapist. That is, part of your job now is a therapeutic discussion with the CEO or a therapeutic discussion with the board to calm them down and redirect them and move them forward. It certainly is part of it. And some of that therapy is not, it goes a little beyond what your suggestions have been, Harlan. Sometimes you put your arm around his shoulder and say, this just isn't the right place for you.
That's, that is a turnaround manager speaking. <laughs> absolutely, I mean, and, and absolutely. And, and uh, you know, I've been involved in reorganizations where we have changed management in the middle of I'm the I'm gonna interrupt you. I've seen Andrew working. Right. I mean, here's a trust that we were on. They gave us 80 million bucks, and as of December, we were supposed to have zero, last December, and we had 88 million dollars. So I'm telling you, when he goes about a problem, he knows it, and this is a lesson in life for everybody here, he knows it from A to Z. There are never any surprises in the room when Andrew's on the case. He knows everything. He knows exactly what you're going to do, he knows what she's going to do, and he knows the best approach for us. And so when you're in the room with the CEO, he knows as much as the CEO. When you're talking to the board, you know as much as the board. So how do you calm him down with, with that huge buildup? Well, normally I make them lie down. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, look, it, it's the same way that you all will be successful in what you do. Right? You need to establish credibility. You need to talk about process. You need to think about what are the people you're dealing with concerned about. So when you're talking with a board or a CEO, they're, they're worried about a whole range of things. They're worried about maybe making payroll next week. Um, but they're also worried about, Am I going to get sued personally if I let them deliver the paper clips tomorrow and I can't pay it, pay for it? Um, they're going to worry about, you know, if, you know, two months ago when we did our quarterly report to our lenders and I look back at it, maybe something wasn't valued exactly the way it should be. What does that, what does that mean? And the biggest issue is, if I go into bankruptcy tomorrow, am I going to lose all my customers? I think that's a huge and, and my And my house. Um, and maybe your house, but it, it, it depends on, on, on the case uh, and the process. And I think what we bring, Michael and I and, and our colleagues in this industry bring, is an understanding that this is a process and that you work your way through the process. And it's... It's akin to litigation. It's akin to an M&A transaction. Um, it's akin to an investment decision. You've got to get your handle around the facts, explain things to people, get them to look a little farther out than tomorrow, uh, and understand that uh, working the issue hard now uh, is the only thing they can do. They help, can't worry about help it. Help me out, because I'm, I'm, be, I'm willing to be stupid up front of everybody, OK? A court of equity and a court of law. There's a difference there, right? And bankruptcy is a court of? Both. Uh-oh. Your partner came in and said you were a court of equity. So. <laughs> no. So, so what Harlan means is that, is that in a bankruptcy context, it, it grows out of what used to be called the equity courts. And that was if there wasn't written le legislation or an established legal concept like torts or something like that, which was intended to govern the uh, relationships between the parties. And that equity, the court of equity, was there to do what was fair and that the judge could determine what was fair. Bankruptcy courts were viewed as courts of equity because what they were able to do at their core was to force people to live with rearranged contractual relationships when there wasn't necessarily a meeting of the minds between the two parties to form a new contract. And so the court could do what was fair. You've loaned this company $100 million on a senior secured basis. It needs $20 million to operate. Somebody says its value is $150 million. And you say, fine, let that guy put the $20 million in behind me on a junior basis. And the new money says, no way am I putting that money in behind you. I'm not taking that kind of risk. As a court of equity, bankruptcy judges would change the order of priority to let that, lo that second loan come in in prime. That gets codified in the statute, and you can do that by, on a statutory basis now. But that's really what 
that's going on there. Uh, and that really only relates to bankruptcy in the United States. Every other country in the world favors, to a much greater degree, the creditor rights. And as a result, you really can't accomplish those kinds of what we call Western style restructurings anywhere else other than here. Let me right. give you and the quick, same, I'm sorry, in the, quick, same, the, same, the same issue, just to, to, to give you another contrast. Um, in most European countries, if you think you're not going to be able to pay for those paper clips tomorrow, as a director, you're going to be personally liable for the cost of those paper clips. In the UK, it's called trading while insolvent. Uh, in uh, Germany, I forget exactly what it's called, except it carries a criminal penalty as well as a civil penalty in Germany. So the unintended the consequence in the UK is you liquidate everything because nobody wants to be personally liable for the paper clips. And I wouldn't say it's the unintended consequence. I would say it is the intended consequence. Right. The intended consequence of that restructuring regime is to move the assets out of the hands of the current managers as quickly as possible, give the greatest return that you can to the senior secured lender in the stack in the hopes that what you will do is preserve jobs. Right, sort of as Jim was talking about earlier, the difference between you know labor pressures here and labor pressures in Europe, it also drives the restructuring regimes in a tremendous way. I was just going to quickly add an example of the lack of a court of equity in France. Again, I think this is true. Uh, the top of the hierarchy, the most important creditor, are pensions, and so what they do is they'll shut a company down and liquidate it so they can pay the pensions of former workers, i.e., they're willing to lose the current jobs for the benefit of the retired worker. In this country, we try to avoid that. We try to preserve the company, preserve the estate, preserve the jobs. So, uh, in summary, I hope you've understood the complexity that Andrew's life and Michael's life entails it, it stems from the fact that this field is different than everything else you've studied in business school. We're not driven by success. We're driven to succeed, but what we're doing is, is we're correcting and fixing other people's mistakes. And as Andrew said earlier, every case is different. Really a very exciting process. So with that summary, let me turn to you guys and ask if there are any uh, questions. Sir? When, when you say the economy isn't doing as well as everyone who came, mean? what do you mean by that? Uh, Is that a fair summary? Well, I think what the point I was making was that the economy is uh, artificially growing because of low interest rates. And those low interest rates are keeping underperforming companies from dealing, being forced to deal with the company-specific problems they have. So what's happening is, is the it's like swimming with an anchor around your neck. Okay? The anchor are those underperforming companies, and until they ca their issues can be resolved or they can be eliminated, they're going to continue to hold back the economy and the better performing companies. Is that... And I think I'd say it a little bit, um, I think I would say it a little bit differently, right? If the economy was really getting, well, let me put it differently. <laughs> um, I think the economy is growing, but it's growing at such a rate that it feels almost stagnant, um, at least to those of us who are in the restructuring field. And, and the reason for that is that we're not seeing people, banks, lenders willing to take the risk of forcing a company into a restructuring, maybe even a formal Chapter 11 restructuring, where you're, however you want to call it, the company's going to go on the block, 
right? It's going to get restructured. It's going to get sold. Something's going to happen. They're much more willing to kick it down the road, to kick the can down the road, and to maintain the status quo. So there's not that, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I didn't take these courses in undergrad, you know, mostly because math was not a strong suit for me. Um, and it, so it's, you know, made me a little nervous. But, um, you know, I, I sort of look at it this way and I see that capital is being, continued to be held by inefficient managers. And if capital is going to be held by inefficient managers, you're not going to have a real growth in the economy. Things are going to sort of pluck along. And I think that's what I, I, I that's the way I, and that's what I'm seeing right now. I'm not seeing people willing to take a lot of risk across the board to grab assets and make them grow. We, I want to see rates go up to the point where companies have to justify the investment being made in them as opposed to simply reducing the overall borrowing rate and, and avoiding the problem until in the future because tomorrow is going to be a better day. Because I don't think tomorrow is going to be a better day until we flush some of these companies and some of these management teams out. I, I, I think, uh, for, <laughs> well, we're down to just two. Um, thinking about what Michael is saying uh, in a different dimension, we have a budget problem on Capitol Hill. Right, uh, the deficit is, is is the annual deficit is larger than it's ever been. However, the beauty is that in funding the debt, with Bernanke pushing interest rates down to zero, the debt doesn't cost us anything. And so, what you have over time is an accumulating debt, which is not being worked down, with a continuing deficit. Someday, I don't know if it's a year from now or 10 years from now, interest rates go up and the U.S. will be bankrupt because the amount of debt at that time will be gigantic and it will have to pay real interest as opposed to 10 basis points. It'll pay 450 basis points. That's a 45x on the interest payments being made. We can't make the dollar. And that's what Michael's talking about with companies is you have a company that can't pay its bills, but it's taking its 6% money loans and reducing it to 3% loans. Oh my God, they're doing great. This company just reported higher earnings. But in fact, the fundamental problems that Michael Grice solves when he turns around a company, they're not doing those things. So let me stop, because this is a great question, but I want to give the mic back to Michael. And just as I ludicrously asked Andrew to summarize the bankruptcy code in three sentences. Let me ask you in three sentences to tell them what you can do for a company when you're given free reign and it's a company that we think ought to be saved. And if you want to ask me when do we know it's a company that's worth saving next, you could. But let me give this back to Michael. I would say the three fundamental things that we talk to a company about are what's its core operations, what can it generate sustainable cash flow with, and what is speculative investing internally. And to recognize that in order to, to internally invest in future potential growth with speculative upside potential, you have to be able to see that you're going to make an enormous return in order to do that. Otherwise, what you're doing is you're using your sustainable cash flow and you're draining it to put into speculative investments. We can help them disaggregate that, their business model to show them whether they're doing that or not. We can also show them whether the price they're paying for growth in their core business, chasing customers, chasing new product lines, is worth it to them, again, through a disaggregation process. And three, we can help them under, understand by putting our arm around them whether or not this really isn't the right place for them. Um, have we got another question? Uh, okay, so we have a core of questioners right in the middle there. Excellent. Hi. Thank you very much for Only coming one more. today. This it, one after that. This is our last question. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for coming today. Um, you mentioned how the U.S. has a very unique uh, style legally of dealing with bankruptcy. The U.K. has their own system, so does Germany and other countries around the world. Uh, in your opinion, which do you think is the most efficient system and I suppose in the sense that it affects the economy? That's a good question. Efficiency, none of them are efficient. Right. I mean, I, now I ask you a question. What do you mean by efficiency? I guess effective in the way it impacts the economy. Okay, so um, I think that if the goal of a reorganization system is to maximize the return to creditors out of the process, the U.S. restructuring code is the best in the world for doing that. And it achieves that in a way that is not necessarily efficient and is extremely expensive, not to, to, to pick up on what Mike, Michael was saying earlier. But it does it because constituents get a seat around the table. You get to fight about value. And there's not a presumption that your senior lender gets to take its collateral and go home. Uh, take the value of its collateral and go home, letting the chips fall where they may. Uh, and um, if your goal, however, is to sustain jobs as the highest priority, uh, then in some ways I think the European model does that very well. Because you clean the balance sheet up, theoretically, really fast because you, your secured lender sells off the assets to a new company or a new owner who theoretically is going to put people back to work or some of those people back to work with the assets they've just bought. Um, and creditors could end up with nothing in the process. And I think that's not a good balance, personally, in the long run. But it also, there's lots of historical reasons why that happened. There's a lot of, a lot of things that, that go into it. It's not as... Um, uh, a draconian is different as I've made it out to be. Um, theoretically, that's the way it works. But Europe, for years, has tried to figure out ways to get around that. The UK system is much closer to ours. Um, while your, your management doesn't get to stay in possession of the business, they get supplanted by an administrator. That administrator has a lot of leeway to try to construct a consensual plan. And so you've seen over the last few years um, enterprises housed in other EU countries seeking to create venue or jurisdiction in the UK to go through a UK restructuring process that they couldn't achieve in France or Italy. And I would just add to that, I, I agree 100% with Andrew's uh, answer, the US is, is the best. The U.S. economic model rewards risk-taking and success. It does not punish the failure for taking a risk. Other countries have in the past, up until fairly recently, in China, bankruptcy was a capital crime. That's a pretty tough penalty for, uh, for making a mistake. And as a result, their economy wasn't based on risk-taking. As they want their economy to grow, they're going to have to take more risks. They had to stop killing people. Okay, but a really quick story about China. China changes its bankruptcy code about five years ago. It's intended to encourage investment into the country, provide uh, uh, certainty for investors. Uh, and one of the first cases under the uh, new Chinese bankruptcy code involved the company that sold the tainted milk around the world. Um, and I wasn't there, and this is purely anecdotal, but I understand that the CEO stood up at the first hearing, was asked a few questions by the judge, went out back, and he was never seen again. So I'm not so sure how it changed. And, and I'm told now, I'm, I'm, I'm. Out of time, and I apologize, but I'm going to just steal one extra minute to finish up to say, um, I believe he was at Harvard, and I think his name was Joseph uh, Schumpeter. Probably completely wrong, again. But he talked about creative destruction. And everybody in the world is talking about innovation and entrepreneurship. That's what Schumpeter was talking about. If you're going to have innovation, if you're going to have entrepreneurs, you're killing older businesses. And you need Michael Grice, you need Andrew Troop to deal with the corpses. Okay, and so to answer your question, 
to answer your question about efficiency, um, I think hedge funds have changed the game very dramatically. The days of, uh, there was a company called Ling Temco Vought, huge company. Its bankruptcy was 14 years long. Hedge funds would never allow that to happen. They'd, they'd get in there, they'd acquire the securities, they'd cut the pieces away, they'd get their value, and we'd move on. We'd have had that smooth, efficient, creative destruction that they talked about. So uh, I will just, for my guest, say uh, your business careers are beginning, and we hope we never see you again, <laughs> because that will mean you've been a big success. Thank you very much.